Perfect. So it is one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today during our virtual World's Fair. My name is Rebecca Quam. I am the Curator of Education Outreach at the DAR Museum. And today I am joined by Grant Quatermus, um, and he will be speaking, and his lecture is entitled Britannia Visits the White City, the Peter Family, and the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. Now, before I allow Grant to talk, I'll just do a quick introduction um, on who Grant is. Um, Grant is the curator at Tudor Place Historic House and Garden. Um, before going to Tudor Place in 2015, he was the assistant curator of collections at James Madison's Montpelier and worked for nearly nine years on the mansion interiors initiative to research and furnish the mansion following its architectural restoration. He holds a BS in history from Murray State University and an MA in anthropology with a concentration in historical archaeology from the University of South Carolina. He is an alumni of the 2011 and 2014 Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts Summer Institutes and the 2017 Victorian Society in America's Newport Summer School. His most recent project, a book focusing on the late 19th century reminiscence of longtime Tudor Place owner Britannia W. Kennan is forthcoming with an anticipated release this fall. So without further ado, I am going to switch it on over to Grant and he will be able to speak more on his presentation. So let me go ahead and allow Grant to get started. Thank you very much. I am happy to be here today and talk about Britannia's experiences at the uh, World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. Give me just a moment to share my screen here. I'll pull my PowerPoint up. Okay. Early in the summer of 1893, an invitation arrived at Tudor Place. Addressed to Britannia Kennan, it was from the Virginia State's Board of World's Fair Managers asking Britannia to attend Virginia Day, the celebration of the Old Dominion that took place on August 9th, 1893 at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Today, we're going to travel with Britannia to Chicago to attend the Columbian Exposition, an extremely important social and cultural event of the late 19th century that had a profound and lasting impact on American architecture, technology, and the arts. The postcards and letters sent by Britannia and the grandchildren who accompanied her are found today in the Tudor Place archive and provide valuable details about the family's experience during their week-long visit. This included time spent as invited guests to Virginia Day, the uh, celebration of the Old Dominion that took place at the Virginia State Building, which was an exact replica of Mount Vernon, specifically constructed for the fair that housed exhibits focused on Virginia's history. And thanks to surviving images documenting nearly every aspect of the exposition, I can show you many of the exhibits that Britannia would have seen when walking through the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building or while walking down the Midway Plaisance. Finally, I'm going brief to briefly discuss while Britannia traveled to Buffalo, New York after departing Chicago. For many 21st century Americans, Eric Larson's Devil in the White City served as an introduction to the world's Columbian Exposition. Held in Chicago during the summer and early fall of 1893, the exposition commemorated the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World. Now, obviously, the 400th anniversary was 1892, but these things take time, and the exposition didn't open until March 1st of 1893. It was only open for five months, from March to October. During that time, more than 27 million people visited the exposition. Now let that sink in, 27 million people. That means one out of every five people living in the United States in 1893 traveled to Chicago to attend the fair. The exposition introduced Americans to the Ferris wheel and to products and appliances like the automatic dishwasher, the zipper, and one of my favorites, Hershey's milk chocolate. 
the grand scale of the Columbian Exposition is almost difficult to comprehend when looking at the surviving images. Located on a 600 acre campus in Chicago's Jackson Park, the epicenter of the fairgrounds was called the Court of Honor, known as the White City because of the way that its massive white neoclassical buildings glistened in the sunlight. The 14 buildings that comprised the Court of Honor were monumental in scale and designed by some of the foremost architects of the era, but they were only temporary. Made with steel skeletons, they were covered with strips of wooden lath and staff, a stucco-like material that could be carved or molded. To add to the spectacle each evening, the buildings were illuminated by thousands of electrical light bulbs, providing a memorable impression for all who witnessed it. It was Chicago architect Daniel Burnham, the exposition's director of works, who was credited with the overall design scheme and the Beaux-Arts aesthetic of the buildings. It was originally Burnham's business partner, architect John Root, who was charged with the task. However, Root died of pneumonia in 1891, leaving Burnham to undertake the project by himself. Root's lasting contribution was his idea that no one architect should design these buildings, but a number of the best architects in the United States, all working together on one commission. And the monumental buildings were designed by some of the most eminent American architects, including Richard Morris Hunt, and firms such as McKim, Mead, and White, and Chicago's own Adler and Sullivan. Landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted was selected to design the landscaping of the exposition's 600-acre grounds. Olmsted was responsible for New York Central Park and the grounds of the United States Capitol building here in Washington. For the exposition, Olmsted transferred a marshy stretch of wasteland on the shore of Lake Michigan into the White City with lagoons, curving promenades, and ornamental gardens. Olmsted wanted to elevate landscape design to an art form equal to architecture or sculpture, and he saw the Columbian Exposition as an opportunity to do so, saying the profession was more than deciding on the placement of flower beds. For the average fairgoer, like Britannia Kennan, who lived in a world of horse-drawn transportation and gas lights, the fairgrounds and the modern innovations experienced during the visit would have been breathtaking. It's almost hard to think of a 21st century parallel. But as someone who is fascinated with this defining event of the Gilded Age, I could spend hours talking about the Columbian Exposition and its lasting impact on American culture. But today we're going to look at how Britannia Kennan experienced the exposition, as well as some of the souvenirs that she brought back with her that I'll be discussing momentarily. In the summer of 1893, Britannia Wellington Peter Kennan was 78 years old. Widowed for almost 50 years by this point, Britannia had already raised several generations of the Peter family, including her daughter and two stepsons after her husband's death in 1844. Britannia and her mother also served as guardians for the four orphan children of her sister America after her death. And this is also a good time to mention that her parents, Thomas and Martha Peter, were very ardent Federalists, so they named their three daughters Columbia, America, and Britannia. Now, the Civil War was an equally difficult time for Britannia, who was very strongly Southern sympathizing and actually took in Union officers as tenants at Tudor Place to prevent the house from being seized by the federal government. Like many Southerners, Britannia suffered financial setbacks following the war, but it was soon replaced by joy when her daughter Marky married Dr. Armistead Peter, a first cousin once removed. The couple pictured here lived with Britannia at Tudor Place and welcomed five children over the next 12 years. In 1886, Marky died suddenly, leaving her widower husband and five children ranging in age from six to 18 years old. So Britannia, much like her great-grandmother Martha Washington had done a century before, stepped in and raised her grandchildren as if they were her own children, the two youngest even living with her at Tudor Place. For Britannia, the trip to Chicago was both an adventure and a much needed vacation, the first one she had taken in years that was not a visit to one of the mineral springs in the western part of Virginia. By 1893, Britannia was also well known as a living descendant of Martha Washington. The colonial revival, born out of a sense of nostalgia for the colonial past around the time of the 1876 centennial, brought about a sense of renewed interest in the founding era and the founding fathers of our country. Britannia was an early member of the DAR and the Colonial Dames, and in 1890, her collection of Washington objects at Tudor Place, which, no, which at the time 
numbered more than 500, was the subject of an article in the Century magazine. I suspect the primary reason that she was invited to Virginia Day was because by 1893, she was the closest living relative of Martha Washington. Now, as a 78-year-old woman, she dare not travel to Chicago alone. First, Victorian decorum dictated that it was improper for a woman to travel without a male escort, both for her protection and for assistance. For this trip, Britannia took her 18-year-old grandson, Freeland, and her 13-year-old granddaughter, Agnes. They would travel to Chicago by train, the quickest mode of transportation available in the late 19th century, and the journey would take about 24 hours total. Two sleeping berths, numbers seven and eight, were secured in a Pullman car on a train departing Washington at 10.15 a.m. on August 7th. In 1893, Washington's Baltimore and Potomac Station served as the primary point of entry and exit for rail traffic in Washington. It was located at the corner of 6th Street and what we now know as Constitution Avenue, where the National Gallery of Art now stands here. And yes, passenger trains actually crisscrossed the National Mall at that time. It would be another decade before Senator James McMillan presented his plan to remove all rail traffic from the National Mall. The route that Britannia and her grandchildren took to Chicago isn't that much different from a rail trip I took from Washington to Chicago two years ago, except I'm going to go out on a limb and presume that their train, unlike my own, arrived in Chicago on time. From Washington, their train would have traveled north through West Virginia and Pennsylvania. At Harrisburg, they headed west and then crossed into Ohio. And after traveling the width of Ohio, the train would have crossed into Indiana with the last few miles of the trip following the shore of Lake Michigan and into Chicago. I can only imagine our travelers' reactions at seeing the Chicago skyline as it started to come into view. Washington had some tall buildings in 1893, but nothing compared to Chicago. The District of Columbia's first resi residential skyscraper, the Cairo Hotel near DuPont Circle, was still under construction in 1893. And the old post office with its 315 foot tower was also still under construction at that time. Up until this point in her life, the largest city that Britannia Kennan had ever visited was Philadelphia in the late 1830s. So Chicago, even in the 1890s, had an impressive skyline and block upon block of skyscrapers. The site clearly made an impression on grandson Freeland as well. He was so excited to be in Chicago, he actually left his Kodak camera in his sleeping berth on the train. The next day, writing to his brother Armistead in Georgetown and asking him to contact the railroad to locate it. Had Freeland remembered his camera, I'm sure we would have an amazing photographic record of Britannia's trip to the fair, since we have no shortage of photos of the Peter family at Tudor Place during that same year. During their week in Chicago, Britannia and her grandchildren stayed at the World's End, which was located on Madison Avenue. The, the hotel overlooked the fair's Midway Plaisance, and one 1893 advertisement described the 800-room hotel as, quote, fireproof, constructed of steel beams and fireproof tile, which was clearly an appeal to travelers worried about the outbreak of another Chicago fire, like the one that devastated the city in 1871. Rates were $2 a day. Britannia, like Britannia's party, like most visitors, would have walked from their hotel and entered the fairgrounds at the Madison Avenue gate, which put them on the fair's Midway Plaisance. Admission to the fair cost 50 cents per day, but I suspect as an invited guest that Britannia received complimentary passes, at least for the day of August 9th, when the Virginia festivities were held. After entering the fairgrounds, they could stroll through the mile-long Midway Plaisance, and now is a good time to note the term that I've been using to describe this area of the exposition, Midway Plaisance, featuring attractions and rides, is where we get the derivative term Midway, still used today to describe this area of a county or state fair. Walking down the Midway Plaisance, Britannia would have passed a number of interesting amusements and attractions, a panorama of Hawaii's Kilauea volcano, a tethered balloon ride that would ascend to a height of 1,500 feet, and a group of Bedouins who would put on a show of mock battle. Each of these attractions required its own admission separate from the fair's 50 cent ticket. About halfway down the midway, Britannia would have walked past what was surely the most impressive sight at the fair, 
the Chicago Wheel, the invention of George Washington Gale Ferris, a staple of amusement parks and fairs to this day, better known as the Ferris Wheel. Rising to the height of 264 feet, it was intended to rival the Eiffel Tower, constructed as the centerpiece of the 1889 exposition in Paris. At the end of the Midway Plaisance, they would have reached the Court of Honor, those 14 neoclassical buildings that served as the centerpiece of the fairgrounds and surrounded the Great Basin. To the north of the Court of Honor lay the state buildings. 36 of the 44 states in the US in 1893 were represented at the fair. Three territories who were not yet admitted as states, Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma also had buildings hoping that there had a building, excuse me, it was a shared building, hoping their presence at the fair would help their bids for statehood. Each state was responsible for designing and funding their own buildings, and many states relied on private donations from wealthier residents. The New England state buildings were grouped on the lakefront, seen here. The southern states, including Virginia, were clustered toward the northern edge of the fairgrounds, and the Midwestern states were placed at the western portion of the fairgrounds near the Palace of Fine Arts. And states were not shy about trying to outdo each other when it came to their state buildings. Most of the buildings were designed in architectural styles representative of that state or designed to resemble famous buildings from that state. For example, the Pennsylvania building's design was based on the old Pennsylvania State House, better known as Independence Hall. Its walls were made from Philadelphia pressed brick and its roof was covered with Philadelphia tin, all sent to the fair from Pennsylvania via railroad. And in its building, the state of Pennsylvania displayed the Liberty Bell, not a replica, the actual Liberty Bell, which was sent especially for the fair. Not to be outdone, California displayed one made out of citrus. The states that were original members of the 13 colonies highlighted the architecture of their colonial past, like Massachusetts, whose building was a replica of John Hancock's Boston House. Relatively new states like Idaho featured a more rustic style of architecture, and other states like New York went a little overboard with this building designed by the firm of McKim, Mead, and White. As I noted at the onset of my lecture, Britannia was an invited guest to Virginia Day, the August 9th celebration of the Commonwealth and its 286 year history. The epicenter of the celebrations was the Virginia State Building, an exact replica of Mount Vernon constructed especially for the exposition. The mansion's floor plan was based on measured drawings of the Fairfax County, Virginia original by architect Edgerton Rogers, and it was furnished with exhibits, Virginia antiques, and replicas of some of Mount Vernon's furniture since the originals were deemed too precious to lend. In the late 19th century, Mount Vernon was viewed as a quote, true Southern symbol, and Virginia Day presented attendees with a nostalgic look at antebellum Virginia. Invited guests included distinguished former Confederate military heroes, members of the now defunct planter class, and supporters of the New South of Virginia. Remember, Remember, in 1893, the Civil War was not too distant of a memory for many fairgoers like Britannia Kennan. As Lydia Brandt discusses in her 2009 Winterthur Portfolio article about the Virginia State Building, the objects found in the building evoke, quote, figures significant to Virginia history from Washington and Jefferson to Confederate President Jefferson Davis and General Robert E. Lee. This replica of Virginia was intended to create for fairgoers the impression of an un uninterrupted evolution of the state's grace from the colonial plantation on the Potomac through the Confederacy's heroism in the Civil War and into the prosperous future. A little marketing there from the late 19th century state of Virginia. And who embodied these ideals more than Britannia Kennan? the only living great granddaughter of Martha Washington, a woman who was not shy about her Southern sympathies during the Civil War, or the fact that she was one of the members of the wedding party when her first cousin, Mary Custis, married Robert E. Lee. In describing the events of Virginia Day, the Chicago Tribune noted, quote, the social cream of the Old Dominion was everywhere visible. Majors, colonels, brigadiers, and FFVs were the order of the day. FFVs being, of course, the first families of Virginia, people who were direct descendants of those early aristocratic settlers with names such as Bland, Randolph, and Skippeth. 
the Virginia Day celebration of August 9th began at the Exposition's Music Hall at 2 p.m. that afternoon. General Fitzhugh Lee, former governor of Virginia, Confederate general and nephew of the late Robert E. Lee and one of his biographers made the introductory remarks. Give a politician a dais and a captive audience and they will run with it. As the Tribune reported, Governor Lee, quote, dwelt mainly on the relation of Virginia and its statesmen to the development of the principles of American freedom. Next, Senator John W. Daniel presented an overview of Virginia's history from its founding at Jamestown in 1607 to the present era. After covering the 286 years of history, he brought it home with his closing paragraph, and when the eye wearies of the colossal structures of commerce and the gorgeous palaces of art that here surround us, it kindles anew with genial light as it rests on that modest tenement which Virginia has set amongst them, Mount Vernon, home of Washington. As you can imagine, the crowd cheered widely wildly. Finally, Dixie and other Southern songs were played by the Iowa State Band, who stood in since Virginia did not bring their own band to the fair. The program ran long, and everyone barely had time to make their way over to the Virginia building for an invitation-only dinner and reception that evening. In describing the events of the Virginia building, the Chicago Tribune noted that Mrs. Britannia Kennan, the quote, oldest and nearest surviving surviving relative to George Washington was present for the festivities. Well, what they should have said was Martha Washington, but I'm sure they were going for impact. The main appetizer that evening was Smithfield ham on biscuits, still a good staple of any Southern cocktail party. The festivities concluded after dinner with fireworks, and the last one being an outline of Mount Vernon in, quote, lines of dazzling light. As they were leaving the Virginia building that evening to return to their hotel, Britannia and her grandchildren would have seen one of the nightly illuminations where the Court of Honors buildings were lit, were lit by thousands of electric lights. And remember, this is an era where gas lights were the primary form of lighting, both street lamps and for most homes. So as you can imagine, seeing these illuminated buildings and statues would have been a very memorable experience, especially for a woman like Britannia, who relied on a single chamber stick when climbing the stairs each evening to her bedroom since Tudor Place electricity, since Tudor Place lacked electricity and relied on gas lights up until her death in 1911. Now that Virginia Day had concluded, Britannia and her grandchildren could really explore the other buildings of the exposition. If the prospect of visiting a 600 acre campus with more than 200 buildings and cultural attractions in only a few days seems daunting, imagine how it must have felt to someone from a small Midwestern town who had journeyed to Chicago for a single day to attempt to see the fair. Whole guidebooks were published recommending itineraries and suggesting an order in which to see the various buildings. Most sources, like these Rand McNally travel guides, recommended spending a week at the fair and visiting several buildings per day. And to say some of these buildings were large is a vast understatement. For example, the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building, where Britannia and her grandchildren spent the day of August 10th, was so massive that if it were still standing today, it would rank second on a list of the world's largest buildings, occupying some 8,500,000 cubic feet of space. Covering, ex covering an expanse of 44 acres, the building could have held the Great Pyramid beneath its glass roof. At the time, it was the largest enclosed building ever constructed, and it brought together exhibitors from around the world. As grandson Freeland noted in a letter home to his brother Armistead, quote, I took grandma through the manufacturers and liberal arts building, the largest on the grounds. After we went through it all, grandma said she felt a little tired, so we came home. It must have been physically exhausting and mentally overwhelming a 44 acre space under one roof. The name of the building implied its dual purpose, the display and promotion of manufactured goods, complete with price tags, along with exhibits that were part of the humanities. Exhibits of the latest products could be found under the same roof as the massive 70 ton telescope, the Yerkes telescope and museum objects, such as a manuscript copy of Lincoln's inaugural address. As one author has described it, it was the most eclectic of exhibits combining goods for sale with items of historical and artistic interest. 
about 80% of the building was devoted to the manufacturers. And looking at this map, you can see that there was a section for every interest, ranging from kitchen sinks to caskets. Each of the companies and manufacturers who exhibited at the fair wanted to highlight the most innovative designs and technically sophisticated products they offered, whether they were based in Paris, France, or Peoria, Illinois. Visiting the booths of Tiffany and Company, Britannia and her grandchildren would have seen this monumental silver vase known as the Magnolia Vase, the centerpiece of Tiffany's exhibition. The editor of the New York Sun described the piece as, quote, one of the most remarkable specimens of the silversmith's art that has ever been produced anywhere. The design of the vase was an expression of national pride, the form inspired by Pueblo pottery, while Toltec motifs embellished the handles. The ornaments displayed vegetation from various regions of the country depicting pine cones, magnolias, goldenrod, and even cacti. Today, this remarkable object is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Or Britannia could have walked through Louis Comfort Tiffany's chapel, originally designed for the 1893 exposition and now part of the Morse Museum collection. Adjacent to the Tiffany booth was Gorham's booth, which featured a life-size sterling statue of Christopher Columbus by sculptor Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, best known as the sculptor of the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Columbus required 30,000 ounces of silver for its casting. In case you're wondering why they would go to the trouble and expense of casting a six-foot-tall silver statue, it's all marketing. International expositions and world's fairs like the Columbian Exposition became the most prestigious marketing venue for luxury retailers. The publicity surrounding the fair could make or break a firm's reputation. So the creation of monumental silver vases or life-size silver statues helped firms like Tiffany or Gorham to get additional international attention and press coverage during the exposition. To help visitors keep track of time, a 120-foot tall clock tower at the center of the building featured a large clock that struck the hour. Wandering along Columbia Avenue, the 50-foot wide main thoroughfare running down the center of the building, Britannia and her grandchildren would have seen wax mannequins adorned in the latest Parisian fashions, as well as examples of Russian decorative arts in the Russian exhibition, or the porcelain porch that was part of Germany's exhibition. The centerpiece of that exhibit space was German industry, a 12 foot by 18 foot collage or painting, actually it was a collage comprised of over a thousand individual hand painted tiles created by the Berlin based KPM porcelain manufactory. Georgetown's own Visitation Academy had a booth and a section focused on Catholic education. For several decades prior to the exhibition, the exposition, excuse me, there had been an animosity towards parochial education in the United States, and the Catholic Church saw the Columbian Exposition as an opportunity to correct false ideas about the Catholic education system. After walking through the building, our fairgoers might have taken the elevator to the rooftop observation deck, which offered an unparalleled view of the fairgrounds. Each of the days spent touring the exposition's buildings must have been exhausting for Britannia, the constant walking, the crowds standing in line after line, shoulder to shoulder, and doing all of that while carrying a parasol and wearing a corset and shoes that offered little cushioning or comfort. In a postcard to her grandson, Armistead, Britannia noted that one day she, quote, saw an immense deal, but that it was so hot that she returned to the hotel. And it was hot, 95 degrees that day, according to the Chicago Tribune. To the south of the Court of Honor were the buildings of various countries, as well as additional food, art and cultural exhibits. 46 foreign countries had buildings or exhibits at the fair, including the, immense, the immensely popular Japanese Tea Garden or Ooden, a cluster of Japanese buildings that were a gift to the city of Chicago from the emperor of Japan. The Japanese tea buildings were located on Olmsted's wooded island in the middle of one of the lagoons. Olmsted had intended the wooden island with its meandering paths and fairy lights to serve as a calm oasis away from the crowded exhibit buildings. There was also Victoria House, Great Britain's building on the fairgrounds. Resembling a half-timbered Tudor dwelling, the building's furnishings and interior decor were provided by Johnston Norman and Company, a London decorating firm who had undertaken projects at Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle for Queen Victoria. A postcard that 13-year-old Agnes mailed to her brother Armistead featured an exhibit 
featured an image of this building, the electricity building, the next logical building to visit after leaving the manufacturers and liberal arts. Guides, guides to the fair stated that this building contained, quote, the most novel and brilliant exhibitions of the entire fair. The Columbian Exposition was the first time in the history of World's Fairs that an entire building had been devoted to the uses of electricity. The building featured a plethora of demonstrations for products ranging from seismographs to electrical poultry incubators. General Electric's exhibit featured Edison's Tower, also known as the Tower of Light. The 100-foot tall shaft was encircled by thousands of miniature light bulbs that were synchronized to musical accompaniment so that they would blink in rhythm to familiar tunes like Strauss's Blue Danube. GE's primary competitor, Westinghouse, exhibited some of the inventions of Nikola Tesla, like his egg of Columbus seen here, a metal egg that spun on a disc to demonstrate the rotating magnetic field of an electric motor. Another building that surely would have been of interest to Britannia, and the first one they would have passed when walking from their hotel each morning was the Woman's Building. As an interesting aside, architect Sophia Hayden, the first female graduate of MIT's four-year architecture program, designed the building. Hayden was an MIT classmate of Britannia's eldest grandson, Walter G. Peter, who later became a prominent Washington architect, and his firm actually designed uh, part of the DAR campus there, one of the DAR buildings. Chicago philanthropist and socialite Bertha Palmer led the initiative for the Woman's Building at the exhibition, raising the funding and conceiving a design competition amongst female architects for this important building. Hayden was only 21 years old at the time, and she designed a building featuring light, airy interiors behind a neoclassical exterior. Now, Mrs. Palmer and the architect had strong disagreements about the building. Hayden wanted purity in the design. Mrs. Palmer wanted ornate architectural features donated by her wealthy friends. When Mrs. Palmer's suggestions were not heeded, Hayden was fired. So she ultimately retired from architecture, married, and spent the rest of her life as a painter. And you really have to wonder what sort of career could she have had had she continued in architecture. So unfortunately, that's the way those events occurred. But it's an, really an amazing building. The interior of the building featured murals by noted female artists, such as Mary Cassatt, whose Young Women Plucking the Fruits of Knowledge mural was displayed as part of a cycle called Modern Woman that was a companion to artist Mary McMoney's Primitive Woman mural cycle on the opposite wall. I can easily see Britannia taking 13-year-old Agnes to this building. It featured exhibitions garnered toward the interests of women attending the fair, such as a model hospital and another focused on reform and charity organizations. And Britannia was a member of a number of these organizations, even the uh, president or directress of a number of organizations around Washington. The Women's Building Library was comprised of works by female authors ranging from not ranging from nonfiction by social theorist Harriet Martineau to great works of literature by Jane Austen and the Brontes. Queen Victoria even lent several of her watercolor paintings to display in the women's building as well as objects from the royal collection. Pieces displayed within the building range from ecclesiastical vestments made by nuns from a rural Irish convent to portraits of royalty by female artists, like this portrait on the right of the Tsarina of Russia. A walk through the fairgrounds would have exposed Britannia and her grandchildren to a variety of world cultures. American Indian cliff dwellings, birch bark wigwams, and an Eskimo village were just some of the indigenous North American cultures represented at the fair. Despite the heat of the Chicago summer, Fair managers demanded that the Eskimo wear their traditional sealskin parkas while demonstrating sledding, hunting, and kayaking. They actually later successfully sued the exposition's board of managers for unfair labor conditions. On a wider scale, anthropological exhibits included the street in Cairo, Cairo that introduced belly dancing to Western audiences and a Dahomey village of 30 huts and a population of West African natives from the modern African nation of Benin. Amazonian warriors, as well as a group of 14 members of the Kwakutl tribe, indigenous to British Columbia, were also present. In the 130 years since the Columbian Exposition, anthropologists have written extensively on the presentation of indigenous groups at the fair. 
Franz Boaz, the assistant director of the fair's Department of Ethnology and Archaeology, recruited many of the tribal groups, such as the Kwak Yudel, in a true attempt to demonstrate to fairgoers how indigenous cultures lived. Boaz is considered to be the father of American anthropology, and after the fair, he served as curator of anthropology at Chicago's Field Museum before going on to Columbia University. However, all of these cultural exhibitions that I've mentioned were actually placed along the Midway Plaisance with other entertainment opportunities rather than among the buildings sponsored by westernized countries. This is now, of course, recognized as a further attempt to illustrate Western superiority in an area of colonialism. The Republic of Haiti's pavilion was the only autonomous representation of people of African descent on, among the, build, the country's buildings in the White City. Exhibits in Haiti's pavilion celebrated not only the anniversary of Columbus's discovery of their island, which he called Hispaniola, but also the anniversary of Haiti's independence from France. Frederick Douglass, who had previously served as American Consul General to the Republic of Haiti, was the co-commissioner of the pavilion and used his position to call attention to the racial inequalities faced by African Americans in the United States at that time. One afternoon, while Britannia rested, her grandson Freeland went back to the fairgrounds alone. I suspect he used the opportunity to visit one of the buildings that his grandmother and sister might not have been interested in visiting, seeing perhaps the transportation building or maybe the replica Viking ship that had sailed from Norway expressly for the fair. Like any good tourist, Britannia purchased several souvenirs during her visit to the exposition that remain in the Tudor Place collection. Her 1893 account book, which, in which she recorded every expense she incurred that year, indicates she spent over $6 on souvenirs at the fair. While that may not seem like a large amount today, remember that admission to the fair cost 50 cents, and their hotel rooms cost $2 per night. Britannia's souvenir purchases included a paperweight, probably one of the commemorative varieties sold at the fair, like this one, as well as a handkerchief, a book, a vase, and a tumbler, as well as several coins. As I was doing the research and preparation for this lecture, I actually found two of the souvenir Colombian half dollar coins that were part of our collection. One was found with a note confirming that it formerly belonged to Britannia. The Colombian half dollar was the first commemorative coin issued by the US Mint that was sold as a souvenir at the fairgrounds for a dollar, twice its face value. The additional amount given for its purchase helped to offset the cost of the world's Colombian exposition. On the obverse, the coin featured a bust of portrait of Christopher Columbus, and on the reverse, a view of his ship, the Santa Maria. Public perceptions of the coin wasn't particularly positive. One Philadelphia newspaper suggested if it were not known in advance whose vignette adorns the Colombian souvenir half dollar, the average observer would be undecided as to whether it was Daniel Webster or Henry, Henry Ward Beecher. The Boston Globe noted, quote, the first view of the new Colombian souvenir coin inevitably leads to the expression of regret that Columbus wasn't a better looking man. Britannia also purchased bookmarks and souvenir spoons. A clue on the previously mentioned postcard suggested that Agnes and her grandmother saw more of Chicago than just the exposition's grounds, though Agnes did note that she had visited, quote, nearly all of the buildings. She also mentioned that she had dinner at the Auditorium Theater, seen here. Completed in 1890, the building also boasted a luxury hotel and office space, and they took a drive through Chicago. For 13-year-old Agnes, the trip was a very memorable experience. It showcased for her that there was a world beyond Georgetown, and it's a trip that she continued to refer to. I've even seen postcards in our archives that were written by her in the 1940s and 50s, where she actually references memories from this trip that took place in 1893. After their week experiencing the world's Columbian Exposition, Britannia and her grandchildren boarded another train and headed east to Buffalo, New York. As I noted at the onset of my lecture, this visit provided Britannia with an opportunity to pay her respects at the grave of her sister, America Peter Williams, or Mech, who had died in Buffalo 50 years before. At the time of America's 1842 death, no members of the Peter family were able to make the journey from Georgetown to Buffalo to attend the funeral. 
Now Britannia could finally visit the grave of her sister and her brother-in-law, Captain Williams, who had died in 1846, and see a city that America had described in letters that she wrote to Britannia more than 50 years earlier. Two months after Britannia and her grandchildren, Freeland and Agnes, traveled to Chicago, another of Britannia's grandsons, Armistead Peter Jr., experienced the world's Columbian Exposition with his fiance and distant cousin, Anna Riot Williams, and her mother, who acted as their chaperone. After they returned from their trip, Armistead wrote to his mother, to his grandmother, excuse me, expressing hope that his father, Dr. Armistead Peter, would make the trip to Chicago. We have all seen this great fair except Papa, and I do wish with all my heart that he could be persuaded to leave Georgetown and go to Chicago as well. And I think everyone who visited Chicago and the exposition during its five month run returned home and encouraged all of their friends to visit as well. Another letter in our archive from a Mrs. Hardy, who was a patient of Dr. Armistead Peter, includes her impression of visiting the fair. She described an evening boat trip on the lagoon where she saw, quote, the whole place when lit up by electricity. It was perfectly beautiful. As I said at the onset of my lecture, it's been more than 125 years since the world's Columbian Exposition, but we're still enjoying the lasting impacts of this important event. In fact, some historians say that the 20th century actually began with the exposition a full seven years before the actual turn of the century. So the next time you zip up a jacket or even travel on the Metro, a train system which relies on a third rail as a source of electric power, or even run a load of dirty dishes in your electric dishwasher, you have the 1893 Columbian Exposition to thank as all of these innovations were introduced there. However, the lasting legacy of the world's Columbian Exposition wasn't just the products which premiered there, but ideas it generated. It provided a new holiday for the United States, Columbus Day, and it also provided American school children with a new expression of patriotism, the Pledge of Allegiance. The exposition also served as a source of inspiration for L. Frank Baum, who was living in Chicago at the time. But rather than a white city, Baum would write of an emerald city, the destination where a lost girl from Kansas would journey in his 1900 novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And it's easy to see comparisons between illustrator W.W. W. Denslow's drawings of the Emerald City and the exposition's court of honor. Other parts of the fair proved to be architecturally inspiring as well. For a young Chicago architect named Frank Lloyd Wright, the Japanese buildings provided his first encounter with traditional Japanese architecture that was formative in the development of his prairie style. That same year, 1893, Wright left his position as a draftsman at Adler and Sullivan and started his own firm. As he began designing houses, he started experimenting with an approach he called the elimination of the insignificant that focused on principles that were really inspired by Japanese design and aesthetics rather than ideas found in the West. Also, many architectural historians credit the exposition as one of the factors responsible for the neoclassical revival and the reason why so many government buildings here in Washington that were constructed after 1893 are in the neoclassical style. Last but not least, architect Daniel Burnham, the exposition's director of works, would go on to design a number of notable buildings including a grand train station for the nation's capital called Union Station, as well as the adjacent city post office. But we're not here to discuss the cultural impact of the fair, but rather to focus on Britannia Kennan's 1893 trip. I suspect that for Britannia, the Columbian Exposition must have been an almost overwhelming experience. The size of the fairgrounds, the height of the buildings, and the mass of people would be unlike anything she had ever experienced. During the visit, Britannia would have literally seen the future, the various appliances, technologies, and products that were designed to make household chores and daily life easier and less labor intensive. Here's a woman who relied on gas lights and oil lamps to illuminate the interior of Tudor Place, and she's seeing the white city illuminated by thousands of individual light bulbs that evening as they were walking back toward their hotel. Exactly 100 years before the trip to Chicago in September of 1793, Britannia's mother, Martha Custis Peter, attended the laying of the cornerstone of the Capitol building with her step-grandfather, George Washington. 
think about everything in the United States that had changed during that period of only 100 years. From a time where Martha Peter and General Washington traveled by horse and carriage to the new federal city, and how just 100 years later, here's Britannia traveling more than 1,600 miles by train in the course of this trip, as well as seeing the wonders of electricity and all of the technological innovations presented at the fair. Britannia was one of the few people at the Columbian Exposition who could look upon Bartholdi's statue of Lafayette in Washington and comment on whether it was an accurate likeness, for she had actually met Lafayette 70 years earlier when her parents hosted him at Tudor Place during his 1824 American tour. Also in Britannia's possession, possession was a small portrait miniature of General Washington of, that was a gift, a wedding gift to her mother, Martha Peter, from the Washingtons at the time of her wedding in 1795 that's still found today in the Tudor Place collection. In conclusion, a visit to the Columbian Exposition allowed Britannia to see the future. It offered her an insight into what the world would look like in decades after her death. It allowed her to see how technology, like the moving sidewalk, was being incorporated into all aspects of everyday life how many of the jobs formerly done by servants such as washing dishes would soon be replaced by machine, how concepts such as day and night could be artificially controlled when electric lights could lengthen the day by illuminating a whole city as it had done here at the fairgrounds. It also allowed her to see and interact with peoples whom she'd only read about or heard about from her late husband and her stepson, both of whom sailed to the far corners of the globe while serving in the United States Navy. Finally, the trip provided another opportunity for Britannia to embrace her family history and be recognized as the closest living descendant of Martha Washington. Thank you. All right, thank you, Grant, so much for your very informative talk. I think for me personally, it really gave a very great view of what Britannia would have seen and her experiences. And also for those of us who may not know a lot about the <laughs> Colombian Exposition to really see what was there and to also give us a view into that experience as well. Um, so for the next few minutes or so, we're gonna have a bit of a Q&A session. Um, and if you have any questions, you see the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to type in any questions that you may have for Grant um, after this talk that he had. We do have some comments saying, thank you for including the woman's building. <laughs> It, oh, it, it's a fascinating building. And as I said before, you have to wonder, you know, had Sophia Hayden not gotten into the disagreement with Mrs. Palmer on the design of that building, and had she actually been able to continue as an architect, what sort of amazing architectural career she would have had in the early and probably into the mid 20th century. Absolutely. And the building itself was so beautiful. So yeah, as you mentioned, it's a huge like what if question mm -hmm. that so many like you know historians or general public look back and say what if this was different what if she would have had this long career um mrs palmer disagreed with a lot of people <laughs> she always <laughs> prevailed thank you phoebe <laughs> yes yes i i think she she Yes, she was a force that I don't think you wanted to go against from some other historical descriptions of her that I've read as well, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that comment, Phoebe. <laughs> so let's see if we get any more questions in. Um, oh, this is a great comment. This is a compliment. Best historical presentation I have seen and heard in my over 80 years of oh, life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, that was such a great presentation and the images were beautiful, um, definitely to give a view of what it was like. And, you know, that's what's so amazing too, is there's such a great photographic record of the World's Columbian Exposition. And because so many people visited and brought back souvenirs, there are people who tend to focus, they, they collect these ephemera and souvenirs from the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. There were plates that were made, there were glassware, pillowcases, everything you can imagine of merchandise that was purchased there. Mm -hmm. And I do love how the ephemera has, has been restored and it's still around because sometimes that is the way to really see 
what it was like, what were, what were they attracted to? What did they really want? So it was so great that Tudor Place has those bits and pieces that she mm -hmm. brought back with her. Um, also hearing the prices of all of them, yes. very different from how we think about souvenirs today, that is for sure. Very much so. And I see the question, actually a great question about what happened to the buildings and the land after the fair. And that's actually a great question. Of course, there was a fire toward the end of the fair. A lot of the buildings were destroyed. Of course, the Palace of Fine Arts, which was the only permanent building built there on the fair campus is now, I believe, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And uh, I believe there is an extant ticket booth that's at another historic house museum, I believe in the Chicago area that has been converted to another use. But yeah, again, these buildings were not meant to be permanent. They were meant to be just temporary constructed for the life of the fair. That's why they were just a framework with, you know, black staff covering them. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And this is actually an interesting question to think about um, with the influx of people. Did Chicago have, do you know if they had like enough hotels or places for people to stay or were those also temporary buildings as well? I, I think there, there was a huge building boom related to Chicago getting the fair. Of course, there were a number of other cities who were in competition to try to get the fair that year. But, and as I mentioned, the uh, building that Britannia and her grandchildren stayed in the world and advertised that it was fireproof because, you know, this was only you know, a little more than 20 years after the Chicago fire, you know, we're, we're a fireproof hotel, we're a safe place to stay after that. So yes, there were uh, a number of hotels. And what's an interesting contrast, time really didn't allow me to go into it today. But when uh, Britannia's other grandson, Armistead Peter Jr., his future wife and mother-in-law went to the fair, they actually stayed at the Hotel Richelieu, which was a hotel over on the lake. So very far away from the uh, campus of the World's Fair. So they, Mrs. Williams clearly wanted to stay in a very luxurious accommodations and she picked that over proximity to the fairgrounds where again, Britannia and her grandchildren are within walking distance of the fairgrounds at the World's Inn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have some questions about potentially what specific states would have presented um, like the Florida building. Um, do you happen to know what some of those states, I know you mentioned like I'm from California, so I heard okay. California and the Liberty Bell of Citrus. I'm like, yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you yeah, know there, any of the other states that would I will just say there, there are some people, people have done some great research on this. So I would just say, you know, for lack of a better suggestion, Google it. There are great, uh, there are surviving images and whole websites devoted to each of the states and the various buildings. I mean, I you, you could do a lecture on each of the different states and again, how their buildings, what they presented, even the architectural style of the buildings, as I said, it, it was, it was just fascinating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you for that. Hopefully that'll help Beverly. I hope that will- uh, Yes, and actually, and, and to visit. expand on that, I believe, um, I don't believe any of the state buildings obviously are still standing since they were all temporary, but some of the uh, the buildings that the various countries put up, they some of them were moved around and some of them, I believe it's one of the Scandinavian countries. The building was recently, I believe it was in, I think Wisconsin up until the last decade or so ago. And then it's since returned to that country and is part of a museum there. It was a log structure, so it, or a frame structure, so it could be reassembled and stuff. But yeah, it's an interesting survival. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really interesting, actually. That's very, very interesting. Um, I know we've answered some of the questions. I guess what interested me the most, and I'm not sure if you can answer this, is you had mentioned the amount of photographs and mm -hmm. just the ephemera that is available. Obviously, coming in to this more modern age with the World's Fairs, you can look on social media. People like, you know, want to learn more. Is this have you done any other research in other World's Fairs or since you are focusing most on Britannia's story, is the 1893 exposition the core of your research? I th it, it's primarily been the core of my research and it's especially the one that some of the later early 20th century fairs were sort of trying to outdo. Very much like 1893 was trying to outdo uh, the, the Paris Exposition. Of course, as I said earlier with, uh, you've got the Ferris wheel, which was trying to you know, outdo the Eiffel Tower, which was sort of the, the marvel of the uh, Paris Exhibition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I, I primarily focused on this exposition just because, and you know, using Britannia's trip as a lens to sort of look at this exposition and its impact, because it really is, it had a huge impact on American mm -hmm. culture. As, as I said, a lot of historians really believe the 20th century began with this exposition, not 
you know, on, you know, the first day of the year 1900. Right, right. So interesting. We did get a couple more questions. Um, in addition to the fire at the end of the fair, weren't there other tragedies? I've heard a oh. little bit about this, but <laughs> do you want to expand on were there any other major yeah, moments? I, I, as as I said at the beginning, a, a lot of people are, you know, th their introduction to the 1893 exposition, exposition came from uh, the book by Eric Larson, Devil in the White City, of course, looking at uh, the uh, serial killer for lack of a murderer who was there at the fair and some of that. So I, I won't go into all that since that really doesn't relate to Britannia, but yeah, I will. But that's that's probably what the reference is. Mm -hmm. So great book to go into. Yes, yeah, yeah, I will, yeah. Um, another question, do you know if any furnishings of the Virginia building were actually from Mount Vernon or from other historic buildings or were they reproduction? That, I, the, a, a number of, uh, dis families in Virginia lent historical objects. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe uh, Mount Vernon at the time declined to loan any of the original Washington objects because they didn't want them to travel. They felt they were too um, fragile to travel. But yes, there was historical silver. There was some historical documents and things from other uh, families and stuff in Virginia. Okay, great. So that was Deborah's question. Deborah, okay. that's the answer to that question. And like I uh, said, that there's there's a great article just on the Virginia building that uh, I mentioned from, that uh, Lydia Brandt wrote that's in the Winterter portfolio from 2008 or nine, I believe. Okay, great. That's a great resource for that. Great. Um, we did have, where was that other question that just came in? Um, how did the Liberty Bell fare on the trip? Do you happen to know more about the Liberty Bell and its transportation? That's a great question. And I believe there was an article in Smithsonian Magazine a couple of years ago, just about that trip and another trip that the Liberty Bell was taken on. It's, it's imagined to think about, especially for me as a museum curator, to think about these, you know, rare historical objects. Well, I mean, you know, we, museums loan objects mm -hmm. even into today, but it's, do you think about how, you know, some of these traveled, uh, in 1893, very different than they would today. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, again, when you stop to really think about the interesting things at the fair, and like, well, another interesting example about objects at the fair, that uh, statue of Columbus that I mentioned uh, melted down. They didn't, you know, it's oh, wow. a lot of silver. It was no, reused, I believe. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thankfully, it did make it back up. It made the trip back or to Chicago and back yes, to Yes, the Liberty Bell, yes, yes. So it's thankfully it survived the trip and it made it back. So that is great. Well, if there are any final questions, type them on in. We have time for like one or two more if anyone has any more. Um, otherwise, I want to thank you, Grant, so much for speaking with us today. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you all for joining in on our talk and our lecture. Um, after this is over, this video will be available on our YouTube channel. So you can go back for reference. If you're like, what was that book that he mentioned? It will be available on our YouTube channels. Um, we hope you enjoyed the talk and we hope you enjoy the rest of our virtual world fair. So thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, Grant, for oh, well, your expertise. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. Bye now.